The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the word. I do the word naturally. Therefore today, I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus' name, and every believer says a powerful amen. We want to welcome everybody connected to this service by way of Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, all of the social media community, brothers and sisters online. We're so glad to have all of you in the house tonight. We rejoice to see all of you connected wherever you're watching around the world. We also want to welcome the Akwai Bomb State community connected to this service by way of Comfort FM, XLFM Radio, Akwai Bomb, Passion FM, Inspiration FM, and Heritage FM. We're truly delighted to have all of you connected to the service guys get ready it's going to be a time of learning and growing in the word of his grace do me the favor of calling a friend a family member ask them to tune to this radio station right now life is flowing through the airways our social media brethren let's get this word to the ends of the earth so everybody help me share the video put them on all the groups let's get the word around the world all our campuses around the world, we are so glad to welcome all of you brothers and sisters all over the world to the service tonight. Glory! We are truly excited to have all of you here in the house. Is there anybody excited about the opportunity to hear the word and to fellowship in prayer? Can we celebrate our fellowship with a shout tonight? Glory! Amen! Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible with your phones. Let's get in the word tonight. Glory to God forevermore. Uh, uh, uh. Help me share the video on your pages to the various groups where you belong. Let's get this word to the ends of the earth. Amen. All right, we're still examining in Christ realities. Brother Paul's revelation of identification. Brother Paul's revelation of identification in Christ. So critical to spend more time looking at this, especially as we are still laying foundation to this teaching. I hope you know we are still laying foundation, right? All right. We are still laying foundation. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 15 and 16. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 15 and verse 16. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. <clears throat> Next verse. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So we began to establish that the, you know, Jesus' mode of teaching or the theology of Jesus was Moses' theology. Jesus didn't teach anything outside of what Moses and the prophets taught. That was his theology. In Luke chapter 24, verse 25, he said unto the gentleman on the way to Emmaus, arguably Cleopas and his wife, O fool, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So Jesus was not going to be teaching anything extra or anything new. It is what the prophets have spoken. Next verse. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now look at Jesus' theology. Next verse. And beginning at Moses... And all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So Jesus taught from Moses' theology. Then we began to look at, you know, Jesus' mode of teaching, which we shall do some more work tonight on it. And then we said, the polite theology is an advanced theology of Jesus' teaching ministry. It is advanced teachings of what Jesus taught in the four Gospels. While Jesus taught from Moses' theology. Which means the scriptures are together. Jesus taught beginning from Moses and all the prophets. Four Gospels. Then brother Paul in the epistles took what Jesus taught in the four Gospels and expanded them 
in the epistles. So we said it is not a contradiction of what Jesus taught. Rather, it is an advancement of what Jesus taught. We said Brother Paul is putting much more vocabulary. He's putting much more verbiage to the things that Jesus said. So we said you can call Brother Paul's letters, Christ letters. Christ letters. And so yesterday we began to look at hypodigma, if you remember the hypodigma yesterday. How that Jesus used earthly things and changed the narratives to eternal realities. We saw the temple, which was very critical in the teaching ministry of Jesus since he was teaching from the Old Testament. The temple was critical. We also saw yesterday how that Jesus moved from the temple and he talked about the bread and the wine, which is rebranded as the Holy Communion. And then we began to travel through all of that. Look at Hebrews chapter 9 verse 23 where we stopped yesterday. Hebrews, another hypodigma that, that, that the writer of Hebrews used. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with this. The patterns. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So the pattern are not the heavenly things. The pattern will use temporal stuff. But the heavenly will not use temporal stuff. See that? The pattern will use temporal. But the heavenlies will not use temporal. Because the heavenly will use eternal. Look at verse 24 of that Hebrews chapter 9. It was therefore, okay, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands that means the one that was made with hands was a pointer to the one that is not made with hands which are the figures which are the figures of the true but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of god for us so the the earthly temple was a hypodigma that means it points to something else. And that something else is man. The temple was a pointer to God's futuristic plan that God's ultimate temple will be man. So we began to examine all of that yesterday. And we saw that in the posquino in John chapter 4 verse 23, Jesus was dealing with the same thing. He was using a laterion by saying that you shall no longer in this mountain or in Jerusalem worship. The time cometh and now is when true worshippers shall worship in spirit and in truth. Then we saw brother Paul now using the same phraseology in Philippians chapter 3. We are the circumcision that worship God in the spirit. In the spirit. Worship in spirit and in truth. Which was a typology in temple worship. Now. Now let's look at very quick things tonight. In Philippians chapter 3 where brother Paul was dealing with stuff. Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. Philippians 3 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. That I may know him. So brother Paul having come to that knowledge. Defends his gospel by saying that I may know him. That I may know him. Ginosko authors in the Greek. Ginosko authors. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. Dunamis anesthesis in the Greek. The power of his resurrection. Dunamis anesthesis. Now when he says dunamis anesthesis. The power of his resurrection. In Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. Again that is the spirit of truth. Numa aletia. The spirit of truth. The truth about him in spirituals the truth about him in his resurrection that I may know him and the power
power of his resurrection. Then he now uses another word, the fellowship of his suffering. Very tricky term. The fellowship of his suffering. Because the word suffering is the Greek word pantima. For those of you making notes, P-A-N-T-H-E-M-A, -E pantima, is used 16 times. And Brother Paul used it a lot of times when he says his suffering is a bit technical. He's suffering because in Romans chapter 8 verse 18, Brother Paul says that the suffering, our suffering of this present time, our suffering, Romans 8, 18, our suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 5, he now says, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, the sufferings of Christ abound in us. Which is what we face when we preach the gospel. So it's a bit technical. Again, if you look at Philippians 9, 6 for further study, Philippians 9, 6, Colossians 1, 24 for further study, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11. Obviously, the fellowship of his suffering has twofold meaning. Number one, he shares with me. He coinonias with me on why he suffered. He shares with me. He fellowships with me on why he suffered. Number two, he shares with me the blessedness of suffering for why he suffered. The blessedness of suffering for why he suffered or why he suffered. Number one, he shares with me why he suffered. Number two, he shares with me that blessedness of suffering for why he suffered. And that is what we saw in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness sake. Blessed are they. So he shares with me the blessedness of suffering for why he suffered. Today, when you are persecuted, people think something is wrong with you. The Christianity of today is such that all believers expect is bread and butter. So once a brother is going through a trial or a sister is going through persecution or a brother is going through a challenge for his faith, they begin to say maybe he has done something wrong. Meanwhile, persecution is in tandem with the gospel. Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness sake. So brother Paul now says that I may know him what did he mean that I may know? This is 30 years after the man has preached. 30 years after he has preached. He's saying that I may know him. So the question you have in your mind is, is this a continual everlasting knowing? Because if it's a continual everlasting knowing, then we are in trouble. Because that will mean that everything written in the epistles is not conclusive. If it's an open-ended knowing, it means we are not sure of what was written in the epistles because if 30 years after you have written and communicated the truth of Christ on an authoritative manner and now you are saying you want to know, then it means we can't rely on what you knew because for all we know, what you knew may change. So we want to find out what Paul meant, but that, that I may know him. So was he still knowing God? If Paul was still knowing God, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. In fact, it doesn't add up. <laughs> because if he was still knowing God, we cannot call his letters epignosis. We cannot call his letters epignosis. Because... Epi, E-P-I, is always complete. Epignosis, epignosis. 
epigenosco or epignosis complete. There's nothing more to know after that. So if he's still praying to know him in First Corinthians, you know, chapter 13, he is saying, I know in part, I prophesied in part. Wow. You know, Dr. Damina, don't be speaking on a note of finality. We know in part. You don't know it all. No man is an island of knowledge. So always be flexible. Do not use absolutes when you teach. Use probables. Because for all we know, anything can change. Somebody said, Dr. Damina, why I don't like it is because you speak with a finality. Your words are too absolute. So I said to him, the Bible is an absolute book. So I said questions. For example, did Jesus die? Answer me, power. See, did Jesus die? What's that? Was he buried? What's that? Did he rise on the third day? What is that? If you believe the gospel, are you born again or are you being born again? What is that? The main fulcrum of the gospel is an absolute message. So why is Paul saying we know in part? We prophesy in part. So even Paul said that I may know him. 30 years after ministry. But remember brother Paul says when, when you read you may understand my knowledge. There is a knowledge I have in the mystery of Christ. So when Paul said, I know in part, I prophesied in part, then he now said, now that I am a man, I give up childish ways. I give up Childish ways. So when he says to know in part, he was talking about his past. He wasn't talking about the present time when he was speaking. When I was growing up, I knew in part. But now I am fully grown. I no more know in part. I know the whole. I give up childish ways. When I was a child, I spake like a child. I knew like a child. Now I'm fully grown in the knowledge of Christ. I no more think like that. Meaning, I have arrived at accurate, precise understanding of God. Listen carefully. Christianity is the epignosis of God. Christianity is the epignosis of God. Accurate knowledge of God. And the epignosis of God in Christianity are in the Pauline letters. The epignosis of God in Christianity are in the Pauline letters. And in the letters of the other apostles. The epignosis of God in Christianity are in the Pauline letters and in the other letters of the apostles. So Philippians 3.10 Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 Put it up That I may know him and the power of his suffering Of his resurrection And the fellowship of his sufferings Being made conformable unto his death How did Paul get to that verse 10? He started from Philippians chapter 3 verse 3 He is telling them forget all that worship All that outward worship all that worship in the flesh, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So what he's saying is that the worship of God is in the heart. The worship of God is not in elements. The worship of God is not in, in things. The worship of God is in the heart. The worship of God is in the spirit. John 4. Jesus who said to the woman, the water that I give unto you, when you drink, you will never thirst again. 
So that worship brother Paul is saying here is a worship of the heart. It's a concision of the heart. Not a worship in elements and things. Now look at verse 4 of that same Philippians chapter 3. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he had whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Next verse. Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, I'm a Pharisee. What a CV, man. What a CV. Then he calls all of that CV the flesh. He calls all of his CV. First of all, he puts the CV for you to see. Then he calls it the flesh. You know, brother Paul had mouth. You know why he had mouth? He was both a Roman citizen and a Jew. That's why he had mouth. He was operating the best of two worlds. He was a Roman of the Romans and he was a Jew and among Jews he was a Pharisee. As touching the law of Moses, he was blameless. That should help you know what we're talking about. Look at verse 6 of that Philippians chapter 3. Concerning zeal, if you think you're zealous, I was so zealous that I persecuted the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, I am blameless. That's the person we're talking about. When it comes to the Torah, he knew the Torah and kept everything in the Torah. Blameless. Look at verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Hmm. When he used the word loss here, he must have remembered his experience in Acts 27. Where first of all he said, there shall be loss of every man's life and of the sheep. Then after a while he said, the angel of the Lord appeared to me last night and he told me there shall be no loss of any man's life, only of the sheep and the properties. Loss. So what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. So he calls material worship a loss. Material worship. Coconut service. Koboko service. Popo service. All of it loss. Feet washing service. Anointing service. Loss. Because those are material worship. They are worship via elements. He calls all of them as laws. He brings his experience to bear in the interpretation. Then he sees what happened to him in that shipwreck as exactly what happened to him as a Pharisee. And what he was saying is that God doesn't need things. God needs men. God's temple is not buildings. God's temple is men. Just in the, sh like in the ship, you know, everything was destroyed. The only thing that was saved was man. In that ship, everything was destroyed. The, every the only thing that was saved was man. God is not interested in things. God is interested in man. That's exactly what Christ came to do. So Paul comes in Philippians chapter 3 and he says, I count all these things as laws, yea, doubtless. The Greek word zemia, Z-E-M-I-A, yea, doubtless. I count or I reckon, I reckon it that way, I see it that way, I count it as laws, give me that verse 8, 
Glory to God. Verse 8. Yea, doubtless, Zemir, and I reckon all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. And do count them is an interesting Greek word. Sukabalon. Sukabalon. It means feces from the toilet. Sukabalon. S-K-U-B-A-L-O-N. I do count everything as sukabalon. Dung. That I may win Christ. Used for refuse. He said to me to know Christ. I will have to take my attention from things. As long as my eyes are on things. I cannot know Christ. So to know Christ. I counted all that as waste of time. So I can know the excellency of Christ Jesus my Lord. That I may know him. He says, I see all this as loss. That I may know him. You know what Paul is saying? In order for me to know Christ, I had to count all of that as loss. It was at the point of seeing all my secular achievements as loss that I got to know Christ. As long as all of that still remains important, Two things cannot fight for my, for my, on my priority list. One has to be higher than the other. So I had to downplay everything I was and make it non-existent so I can win Christ. So I can win Christ. You know, that's what Paul was saying. Until the heart turns to the Lord, then the veil shall be taken. As long as your heart doesn't turn to Christ, the veil cannot be taken. While you are seeing candle, while we are carrying oil around, while you are doing feet washing, while you are still eating bread and ribena, while you are still carrying handkerchief and tying on your neck, while you are still anointing your eyebrow for favor, you can't see Christ. Your heart must leave these things. You must count them as dung. In order for you to win Christ. In order for you to win Christ. We had a bit of chat with Bishop Mike this morning. And then he was just saying to me, Abel, I'm just worried about some of the young men that are coming into the ministry and we're seeing them rising in Nigeria. But they're not preaching. They sound like they're preaching the gospel. But when you listen to them carefully, they are not preaching the gospel. They are preaching a mixture. And they are gaining popularity among the young, young preachers. And as I waited for him to talk. I was listening to him. After a while, I said, sir, the problem is mammon. The problem is mammon. These guys are not in ministry because they love people and they want Christ. Ministry for them is a business venture that could fetch money faster than any other enterprise. Just making people mumushious and making people feel like victims and continue to deceive them that they are in bondage. There are 14 keys. There are realms. There are portals. There are depths. There are dimensions. So they keep, they keep, they keep putting the goalpost forward and forward so that you keep working hard you keep striving but you're not arriving and while you're struggling to arrive you're not they tell you sow this seed sow that seed sow the other seed and you begin to feel a satisfaction in will worship so you keep working hard trying to meet up but you're not meeting up it's a wicked version of the gospel and they will call it grace they will call it finished work but their own finished work is not finished. It's more wicked than legalism. 
At least legalism you will see and know. But this one, it's a disguise. It sounds exactly like what we're saying. So you have to be a very good student of the Bible to be able to know that uh, 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 that slant there is not the finished work of Christ. And it will take training. So we got talking and I said to him, sir, don't worry. We are working day and night. We are laboring. We are training disciples. And we are not doing shortcut training. We are paying attention to details. Disciples are rising all over the nation. And you know what happens? When knowledge increases, discernment becomes very sharp. The moment a man starts talking, you can pick where he's going. No matter how he tries to cover it. And that's why there's no shortcut to training. There's no shortcut. We cannot afford to train you in a lazy manner. We have to be dogged. dogged. We have to be thorough. We have to pay attention to every minute detail. So that when you hear another gospel, no matter how it sounds, you can pick the slant in it. Am I talking to somebody? I told him, sir, don't worry, we're here. He laughed, he said, I tell you, but we're here. I said, sir, we're here. We're not going anywhere. We're here for a long time. And we will see, he said, Abel, the truth is falsehood has never lasted before. I said, that's the truth. We're here. And we're not ashamed of what we're teaching. And our disciples are paying attention. The people we are teaching are not fools. They are paying attention. God has given them an understanding heart. So they are catching revelation. And this group, the work of Christ cannot be wasted. Some of them came to ministry because there was nothing else they could do. There was nothing else. And some of them think ministry is the place where you quickly come and gather money. Because all you need to tell people is that they are, they, Satan is after them. All you need to tell people is look for their lifetime experiences and wire it into your preaching and use it to whip sentiment and use it to massage their fear and then use fear as a bait to pull them and empty their pocket. But that day is over. Yesterday I saw something on social media. A pastor was trying to raise 16,000 for 2022 and his members gathered and gave him the beating of his life. It is just the beginning. It is, they gave him the beating of his life. May they even beat him more. I'm sure the members are tired. Every day you tell us is 2022 so a seed of 2,222 so that it will be better. You go and sow. After you sow, things are worse. How long shall we keep this kind of thing? So the members gathered and said, nonsense. <laughs> enough is enough. You think we're joking. You think we're playing here. We're not playing. This gospel is going very far. See, I hear you. I'm not hearing you at all. I'm not hearing you at all. And the spirit of truth is working in the hearts of men. The spirit of truth is working all over the nations of the earth. In our lifetime. In our lifetime. In our lifetime. If you don't preach Christ, eh, you'll be afraid of the pulpit. It's, it's beginning. It's beginning. It's beginning. Where a pastor is preaching and the member stand up and says, excuse me, sir, it's not like that. Hold on, sir. Hold on. Check again. It's not like that. It's not like that. Sir, check again. That's not what it means. And then he now puts it to him. And everybody can see that the boy is correct. The pastor is wrong. Whether he agree or not, the members have seen. <laughs> or after service, brothers will tell, one, two, three, four, five, come, come, come. Did you see what pastor said? Let's look at it again. It cannot be correct. It's true. Everybody will gather his own group. See, 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 see. So the next time pastor is preaching, everybody is, they are checking. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I told him, don't worry, sir. It's time. We're here. We are not here for 100 meters. We are here for the long haul. It's not a sprint. It's marathon. 
It's marathon. It's marathon. It's, you know that kind of race where you run and you pass the button. Eh? And they, they collect the button and proceed. We are passing the button. If you say when we are gone, you will do it to our children. Our children have collected the button. They are holding the baton in their hand. If you are targeting our children's children, our children's children are already in Sunday school. They are collecting the baton. In their little age, they are already challenging their CRK teacher. Sir, it's not like that. He said, shut up, Junior. Sir, it's not like that. Glory to God. What a day to be alive. Ain't you excited tonight? Now let's get back to what we're teaching here. Uh, uh, uh. I do count them dung, scubalon, used for refuse. Scubalon. What happens in the toilet? He said, for me to win Christ, I've got to count those things as dung. It's not an ongoing knowledge. He said, the moment I considered all these things as dung, I arrived at the epignosis of Christ. Now look at how he uses the word pistis in verse 9. Verse 9. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith, the pistis of Christ. Oh boy, I like this. The pistis of Christ. The, 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 the faith which is of Christ. Not my faith. His faith. The faith of Christ. So he now says, I have found righteousness in the loyalty of Christ. That, that is, I have found righteousness in Christ's loyalty. Not all I had to do is pistil or pistis, that is belief. I have found, I have found salvation in the loyalty of Christ and all I had to do was believe. My faith in Christ's loyalty got me saved. And he used it all over his letters. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the loyalty of the faithfulness of the Son of God. I'll get into that in a bit. I live by the loyalty of the faithfulness of the Son of God. Who loved me, who loved me, not whom I love, who loved me and gave himself for me. So he says, Christ is loyal to the law and the prophets. What is the law and the prophets? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Jesus did it. Then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Neighbor, neighbor as yourself. And then Paul now said, I'm a beneficiary of the, lo of the loyalty of Christ. I'm a beneficiary of his faithfulness. He didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And today, Jesus has fulfilled the terms of the law. We are just beneficiaries. And Paul said, I put all these things beside so I can know him. You know, Moses is man in Genesis. Jesus is Moses' is man. And Jesus is Moses' is rest. God rested on the seventh day. The seventh day was Jesus. Let us make man in our image. The man Moses was talking about in Genesis 1.26 was Jesus. The express image of God. Remember, in Jesus, male and female. Male and female created he them. Jesus is male and female. That's why there's neither male no female, you're all one in Christ. Because in Christ, male and female. Adam is not the image of God. Christ is the image of God. So, brother Paul was taken from Moses' theology to open up mysteries of the new creation. You know, brother Paul's beauty in his presentation is found in how he used the book of Genesis to open up realities for us. So Paul says, I have come to know him. 
I have not come to know things. I have come to know him. Brother John will call him the Logos. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Logos. The Logos was with God. The Logos was God. He uses the terms of Pluto and Aristotle who were the word, word smith of their day. They were the word smiths. They were the guys, you know, who put together the Greek. So he uses their words. And he says, what the Bible speaks about is a message. And the message is a person. In the beginning was the logos, the idea. Jesus is the ideology of God. Jesus is the thinking pattern of God. Jesus is God's mindset. The Logos. The Logos. He says, No, this message is a man. That is, all that God will reveal is a man. The revelation of God in his entirety is a man. The Logos. John will say in John 1 14, we beheld his glory in a man. We beheld his glory in a man. John chapter 1 verse 16, grace for grace. John chapter 1 verse 17, grace and truth. Then John chapter 1 verse 18, Ezekomah. Ezegomai, verse 18. No man had seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he had exogomai. Exogomai. He explains God. He reveals God. He unveils God. He is not talking about the resurrection. He is talking about the incarnation. That is in the incarnation, when we saw Jesus, we saw God. He explains God. He is in the bosom, the colpos. K-O-L-P-O-S. Colpos. Bosom. Give and it shall be given good measure. Present and shaken together. Shall men put into your bosom the colpos. Colpos means two of them are together. He's in the chest of the father. That is, you can never see the father without Christ. The colpos. We see his glory. The glory of God. His earthly living is called grace. So when it comes to, to John, Jesus is washing their feet. Eh? Am I too fast? Jesus is washing their feet and he is the water. Jesus is washing their feet and he is the water. So the water he's using to wash their feet is a pointer to him. You didn't hear that. He is the water of John chapter 3 verse 5. Except a man be born of water, that is the spirit. So Jesus is the water. He is the spirit that produces newness. In John 4, 10 and 14, he is the water. If only you knew the gift of God and who accept the water, you will have given me your own water and I will give you living water. You will never thirst. That is when you drink of me the gift of God. You never thirst. So he is the water of John 13. He is the water of John chapter 3. He is the water of John chapter 4. He's called the living water. He is the bread. He is the bread. The bread is not from a bakery. He doesn't use things. He doesn't use things. He is what is used. You didn't get that. He doesn't use things. He is the things that are used. He is the water for washing. 
He is the bread that you eat and never hunger. He is the water that you drink and never thirst. He is the oil that anoints you and you don't need part two. He's the oil that when he anoints you, you don't need new anointing. He is ever new in you. He in you is ever fresh anointing. See how total. You don't need another service after he enters you. He eternally anoints you. He doesn't use things. He is the things. He is the one that is used. That's the grace of God. That's what John saw. That's why John will conclude and call him the word of God. He is the word of God. In the beginning was the word. So he is his water. And that water is spirit. And Paul, Paul was able to latch on that. So he goes to the Old Testament writings. And expands the narratives. Look at 1 Corinthians 6.11. Are you with me? 1 Corinthians 6.11. Ooh, and such were some of you. Are you here? Such were some of you. Help me everybody. Such were some of you, but you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Such were some of you, but now you are washed. Who is washed? The person he now calls one spirit in verse 17. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Who is washed? The person he now calls the spirit of God. In verse 19. Of the same 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Jesus is the water. He himself is the water. He doesn't use water. You didn't hear that. Jesus is the bread. He doesn't use bread from bakery. Jesus is water. He doesn't wait for you to bring water for feet washing. He's the bread. He doesn't wait for you to come and take bread and ribena. When you eat his own bread, it is once and for all. When his water washes you, it is once and for all. His water is not continual. His bread is eaten once. My yoke is easy. Watch this. Watch this. If the day you receive Christ, you don't have to bring animals all the time like they did in the Old Testament. Then the day you receive Christ, you don't have to wash leg. Otherwise, if you are going to be washing leg, you have to be bringing animal. You have to be bringing animal and washing leg. And if you are going to be bringing animal and washing leg, then you can as well eat bread and ride dinner. All of them are continuous action. But as long as you are no more bringing animal, because Jesus is the animal, then you don't need feet washing, he's the water. Then you don't need bread and rabina, he's the bread of life. I feel like I'm talking to somebody here. He doesn't use things. <laughs> it is him that is used. You are not hearing what I'm talking about here. <laughs> Glory! He doesn't use things. He said, Madam, the water I give you, 
When you drink, you never thirst. I am the bread of life. When you eat me, you never hunger. Uh -uh. He doesn't use things. Tell your neighbor he doesn't use things. In case you still have oil in your house. <laughs> you know, some of you are still new in this church. So he said, ah, I like the man's teaching, but oil, wait first. Let me be watching. <laughs> so today, just go carry that oil in it and fry chicken. It will be more useful. It, 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 it expires with the using. It perishes with the using. Anything that perishes with the using is not what Jesus uses. You didn't hear that. Anything that perishes with the using is not what Jesus uses. How many of you know that if I rub you oil now, somehow, somehow, after a while, it will not be there. Why? It perishes with the using. Sometimes it even perishes without using. <laughs> I'm, I'm teaching good here. It perishes with the using. Doesn't it? Eh? Holy water, uncle. Okay, wait, wait, wait. When you eat bread and drink communion wine, <laughs> that time that does your eye like this. <laughs> when you eat it and drink the wine, do you go to the toilet? <laughs> when you go to the toilet, what happens? It stays. It goes. So it perishes. Anything that perishes with the using, Jesus never uses. When you drink of him, you never thirst. When you eat of him, you never hunger. When he anoints you, you never get denointed. Glory to God. Such were some of you, but you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified. You are not going to be washed. You are washed. Sanctified. Justified. You know that the, the, the means closure. Once and for all. Because the water I give when you drink, you never thirst. The bread I give when you eat, you never hunger. I'm teaching good. <laughs> Woo! Jesus is the water. He doesn't use water. Jesus is the bread. He doesn't use bread. In the resurrection, he is the spirit that cleanses in the name of the Lord Jesus. Look at Titus chapter 3 verse 4. Titus chapter 3 verse number 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man appeared. Verse 5. Ooh. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved, saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, so Paul, seeing that Jesus' verbiage was you are born of water. And everybody knows that when you use the word Gina O, Gina O, in the Greek, G E N A O, Gina O, you don't produce. In Gina O, you don't produce. You are produced. You don't produce in Gina O. You are produced. So brother Paul latches on that and says, not of works. It cannot be of works. James knew it. That's why James says, of his own will, begat he us by the word of truth. John and Paul latches on that. Whereas Peter will say, 
that we are begotten again unto a lively hope. How? By the resurrection from the dead. So when Jesus uses the word born of, born of, he gave them what to say. Born of, they now say, not of works. Born not of works. They were just adding to what Jesus said or expanding. The narrative of being born again. Because this kingdom is going to be by birth. Look at that title, Titus chapter 3 again. I want to read from verse 3 to 6. Titus 3, 3 to 6. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Verse 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Next verse. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Next verse. Oh, which he shed on us abundantly. How? Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So Paul calls what Jesus did in his resurrection, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul's water is Christ's finished work. Paul's water. We have seen Jesus' water. We are looking at Paul's water. Is the finished work of Christ. Or the Holy Ghost. Or his resurrection. Paul's water is the finished work. His usage of that, of that symbolic communication water. Water in the Pauline later will be the finished work or the Holy Ghost or the resurrection. Look at Ephesians 5.25, Ephesians 5.25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Next verse. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Next verse. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Imagine if you were one of the twelve and Paul is saying this. Your mind will immediately go to John 13. Washing of water by the word. It will immediately go to John 13. It will go to John 4. It will go to John 3. Because those are the instances where Jesus used water. And Paul now expands it by calling it the washing of water, not by water. Water is symbolic of the world. The only difference in Paul's own is the sophizo in it. The inside. Peter does the same thing. He expands Jesus' vocabulary. In 1 Peter 3, 21. 1 Peter 3, 21. Look at the way Peter expands the vocabulary. The like figure we are on to, please pay attention to this. I'm already rounding up. Are you blessed tonight? The like figure we are on to, even baptism, doth also now save us. Hmm? Hmm? Baptism. Hey. Baptism. <laughs> wow. And a pastor took my teaching on baptism and played it in his church. <laughs> I went to his church to preach. <laughs> he invited me to his church without my permission to preach to his congregation. What a world. He put me in his church on the big screen and I was preaching to his members. And then after some minutes, he will stop what I said. Then he will want to debunk it. But how can a weak argument defeat a superior argument? This is serious. 
The thing that will move a pastor to carry my video on a Sunday service, it means he doesn't have a message. So since he doesn't have a message, I have a message. You don't understand. You don't understand. <laughs> Baptism is not even a better thing he's, he wants to debunk. Is baptism. It's not even eternal salvation is even a more more potent thing to talk about. Baptism. Baptizo. Baptism. That John the Baptist, the baptizer was not baptized. The baptism that the baptizer himself didn't enter the water for. You don't understand. Put it up. The like figure <laughs> we are on to even baptism does also now save us. Then he explains not the putting away of the field of the flesh. Not swimming. Not swimming in river. But the answer, so the baptism here is the answer of a good conscience towards God, which is Christ in your heart. That is the baptism by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Are you watching? Not the one of washing body. Not the one of us. That's a figure. The real thing is Christ. The risen Christ in the conscience of a man towards God. Justification by faith. Look at the next verse. Who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers be made subject unto him. So Peter's water is the resurrection of Christ. Peter's water. So, Paul, therefore, is a skillful expositor of the words of Jesus and the life of Jesus. Of the words of Jesus and the life of Jesus. Because everything Jesus did and said were found in the Old Testament books. Everything he said Everything he did, we are found in the Old Testament books. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He is Noah's ark. He is the blood on the doorpost. He is the rod in the hands of Moses that split the Red Sea. Everything they spoke about was him. He's the water. He's the bread. He's the oil. Glory to God. The good news is he lives in you. Oh my God. Somebody shout that's the good news. Somebody say identification. We have seen what he has done. The identification is how it connects to you. He lives in you today. Hallelujah. Stand on your feet as all I've got for you in this service. Glory to God. Turn to your neighbor say he doesn't use things. Say Jesus doesn't use things. He doesn't use bread. He's the bread. He doesn't use water. He's the water. He doesn't use mantle. He's the mantle. He doesn't use oil. He is the oil. That's why he is called Christos. Christos, Christ. Christos means the anointed one and his anointing. So he is the embodiment of the anointing. And where is he? In you. So the anointing you have received of him abided 
in you. Say with me very loud, I am anointed. No, 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 you're not talking. I am anointed. So the next time somebody tells you, it is written, touch not my anointed. Tell him exactly, touch me not. I am the anointed one. Glory to God. Who is anointed in this building? Somebody shout, there are no levels of the anointing. The anointing is not levels. The anointing is a person. And when he entered me, he didn't enter installmentally. Christ in me. Do you have instrumental anointing? In great. Take. Take. This one is still outside. All of him. The whole of Christ is in you now. That's why you don't sing, I want more of you. No. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't want more. I have all. You are complete in him. Lift your right hand and shout, I am blessed. I have the anointed one and his anointing on my inside. I have Christ, the water of life. I have Christ, the bread of life. I have Christ, the anointed one. I have Christ, God in human flesh. I have Christ, the spirit of God on my inside right now. I thought I will have a powerful amen. Are you blessed tonight? Lift those hands and begin to thank him for, for living in you 